right, good evening, everyone. So welcome to our board meeting. We're gonna go ahead and open the meeting. We do have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please uh, see Virginia Gonzalez at the back there. Um, if anyone would like to speak on an agenda item, then they must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva um, prior to the start of the item. Each speaker will have two minutes. And we will have um, Vice President Shocker hold up a 30 second card because we know that it's really easy to lose track of time once, you're, once you start speaking. All right, so we'll move on to the uh, item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask uh, Trustee DeSerpa to lead us in the pledge. All right, ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, moving on to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. Dr. Rodriguez, our superintendent, will make a few comments. Yes, thank you so much. So we're going to be releasing this um, one-sheeter. We call them one-sheeters, but basically it's a summary of important information that we want people to have. So I think if people have been tracking um, education, definitely statewide, but even nationwide, they are speaking to the shortage of substitutes and teachers that we have within our system. And so um, up top on the document, it specifically talks about three things that are occurring at the state level. And we mentioned this in the one sheeter because we want people to understand that this is um, not a PBUSD issue, but it is a statewide issue. So if you could just go back up a little bit. Um, so there's really three things that have happened within the last month and a, a month. Um, on the 16th of August, the state decided to allow, to waive the SERS waiting period. So normally if someone retires, they can't. They cannot work for the next six months. And then after that point, they can. Um, on August 16th, the state waived that, and now people can come back right away. They also extended the timeline that substitutes can be in a single classroom up to 60 um, school days, not 60 calendar days, but 60 school days. And then lastly, on August 30th, they were there there is such a substitute shortage throughout the entire state that they now have um, changed the substitute permit um, requirement and they are now allowing students that are in an undergraduate teaching program to apply for a substitute permit. So for us, and now you can scroll down just a little bit, thanks. For us, um, it's been... There are three things that cause us to have a lot of the attention. One, we are by far, by far, the largest school district within the county. So we have about 990 classroom teaching positions, which is much higher than most. Um, and then two other things have happened. One is that we did have 141 retirement resignations and leaves for this upcoming school year, which is larger than the normal amount. But probably the most important for us is you'll see the next two sets of numbers. 91 occurred before June 30th, um, which is the date in which Ed Code states that they have to tell us, and 50 have actually occurred after July 1st, including up until tonight, we have had further resignation. So it's 50. We do have 20 vacancies that remain open as of 9:21. I mentioned that it sounds like a lot, but just to know, it is just 2% of our um, classroom employee positions. That actually is a lower percentage than most of the school districts within our county currently. Um, of course, they do not have 20 vacancies, but they also do not have 990 classroom teaching positions. Um, so if you can keep scrolling down, please. So to compound the issue, so we do have the 20 vacancies. We also do have a large number of average um, daily absences, and these are non-COVID related absences, so not on quarantine because of symptoms. You'll see that Fridays are a significantly challenging day for us. We typically have 38 um, teachers out on a any given Friday, which means that we must have 
have um, not only substitutes to cover the vacancies, but also um, also those that are out um, on personal necessity or non-COVID. And so tonight you're going to see um, an action item in terms of the long-term sub. So we pay significantly more than our counterparts. So if you look at the right-hand side for daily substitutes, we pay $180 a day. Santa Cruz County pays $130. And so we pay significantly more. We currently, for long-term sub, we currently pay 200, and we will tonight be bringing forth an item to pay, start paying them $240 a night so that we can hopefully move that forward. Um, Allison Nizal will speak more to why we, we did chose 240, um, but most importantly, it was so that we would have a higher differential between our daily rate and our long-term rate. Because as you can see, it used to be a small differential from 180 just to 200. And so we'll be releasing this in English and Spanish tomorrow morning, um, and hopefully you found this information useful. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments, reports on standing committee meetings. So this is our opportunity for each uh, board member to make a few comments. And um, we'll start with uh, Trustee Dodge. Do you have any comments? Uh, I'd just like to say good evening, everybody. Always good to be back here and sitting at the towers, you know, getting business done and being able to see everybody here. Uh, just briefly, I was able to attend the, the safety committee meeting. It was held on Wednesday. Um, there are people, you know, classified and PVFT workers voiced their concerns about safety issues. Um, I, I know um, at the Alice training came up, um, you know, earthquake intruder, you know, practices or something, you know, maybe to look into and other safety issues. Um, I also just want to say September 25th from 5 to 8 p.m. at the Watsonville High School Geyser Field, the Relay for Life will be holding their opening ceremonies. We all know Relay for Life and the great work that they do. Um, I, I encourage everybody to check it out this Saturday, 5 to 8. Um, if not, I know PVUSD is always active in the, the ceremony. So, I mean, it's, it's always a great event. We support people here in Watsonville. Um, we have all been affected by someone with cancer or, or someone we know or love had cancer. Some of us might have cancer. And so let's just do our part and support and try to find a, find a cure. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Acosta? Um, no, no comments at this okay. time. Thank you. Trustee Orozco? Sure. Welcome, everyone. Um, well, just this past week, a couple of days back, I think, uh, we had our first Green Team Committee meeting. Um, so I just want to thank everyone who is part of that effort. Uh, we did um, have some action steps in, um, in place that we came up with um, so that we can kick up our efforts. So we're very excited to see uh, the work that comes out of um, the Green Team Committee. Um, and then also, just so that uh, the entire community is aware, we are hosting Nerville, which is an awesome family-friendly, student-friendly event uh, that will involve comics, fantasy, art, and collectibles. We have um, not only some of our Rolling Hills students uh, that will be participating on the panel, but also local collectors and so forth. It's really a fun event uh, put on by our community. So I'm hoping that students um, and families come. Uh, PVUSD students will be uh, getting in for free with their student ID. So please spread the word. And lastly, for students who will be starting college soon uh, or looking to apply, the FAFSA application does open October 1. Uh, so start gathering your tax documents um, so that you can get a head start on that process. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Shocker. Thank you, President Hall. So just to echo Trustee Orozco, we met with our green team. Yay! Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for helping with that. Um, 
looking forward to speaking more with our team and seeing what exciting things that we can accomplish in our PVUSD community. Um, also just want to make people aware that there's lots of exciting things happening at both the Watsonville Libraries and Santa Cruz County Libraries for kids that are three, um, from giving away steam kits to um, book readings, so lots of fun things to keep your children busy, so look at that. And then just to address um, some concerns people have had about board members on their computers. Yes, we're on our computers. We have an agenda on our computers. We also have the presentation available so that we don't have to get crooks in our neck from constantly staring to the left or right. So, thank you. And it's all captured by that camera right there. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the live stream. <laughs> all right, uh, Trustee Serpa. Thank you. Welcome everybody and happy autumn. Um, this week I um, attended the Pajaro Valley, um, Pajaro Valley Student Assistance Meeting um, and I'd like to recognize and celebrate our, the Executive Director of PVPSA, Erica Padilla Chavez, who received a very um, special honor from the um, the Health Trust um, at Watsonville Hospital for being a person of the year. So congratulations to Erica. We're very proud to be affiliated with you and you're doing a great job here. Um, the money that has come into that agency to help and bring opportunity to our kids um, is amazing. So I wanted to call that out. Um, the other thing is Watsonville um, Wetlands Watch is celebrating its 30th year in our community to preserve um, sensitive habitats. And about 30,000 children and students have been um, educated and um, participated with them over the years through, their, through our collaboration at um, Pajaro Valley High School. And so I wanted to congratulate them um, on 30 great years and thank them for the work that they're doing. Trustee Soto. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's meeting, and I uh, just want to thank the community for their continued support. And uh, also want to acknowledge uh, all the football teams out there. Good job. Keep it going. Um, tough uh, break for Aptos the other night, but uh, you know they're still fighting strong. So good luck, everybody. Keep it up. All right, and I, I wanted to just take a moment to uh, just acknowledge the work that's being done by our, our SELPA Community Advisory Committee. And if, you know, whether or not you have a student in your life who, you know, is part, receives our, our special education services, I highly recommend checking this out. It's like, like this last, you know, meeting was about, you know, helping, you know, students like, basically adjust to you know their situations and and the conversations were just um, just valuable on so many levels so um, we've had some really good participation we've had some good speakers and I've, I've had the privilege of serving you know of attending these since I started as a board member and I, I just I've, I've been impressed so that's it for me um, item 4.1, we're going to go to approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda, but I'd like to amend it to um, flip items 9.6 and 9.7, please. Just flip them. So okay. make 9.7, 9.6, and 9.6, 9.7. All right. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries with unanimously. All right. So we will move on to <coughs> item 5.1, approval of the September 8th, 2021 board minutes. Uh, can I have a motion? A move to approve. All right. I'll okay. second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. All right, so we will move on to item 6.1, the Williams Sufficiency of Textbooks. The report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre Lewis, as Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. Hi, good evening, President Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. 
Uh, this evening I will be doing the Williams Sufficiency Public Hearing for this year's uh, Williams visit. Possibly. Oh, yes. All right. So the public um, hearing requirements is that the District of the County Office of Ed um, hold a public hearing um, and look at adopting a resolution and then stipulate whether they are aligned to the academic content standards and consistent with um, board content and the textbook instructional um, cycle adoptions. Um, within the board packet, you also had the all the textbook adoptions, the, the materials. Uh, there are 19 schools that are visited with the Williams team. This is my um, first in-person full Williams visit um, that I oversaw. So I took the opportunity this year to go through the process. And so with all of the 19 visits, um, the majority of them I was also present or I had someone on the CNI team present so that we can see it from beginning to end. We took the time to also look at the efficiency of ordering instructional materials, replacement of textbooks, and making sure that the communication was correct. And so we did this looking through the entire process to see how we can really look at the um, efficiencies within our system. So those are the 19 schools that were visited. Not only did we look at um, instructional materials, but the facilities were also looked at in which the report will be coming. So within the efficiency check, looking at what the, some of the things that we need to shore up, the first thing that we notice is that there needs to be a single point of contact. I have dual single point of contact, which means that we need a single point of contact from each school and a single point of contact within the district office. Sometimes right now what's happening is that there are multiple points of contact and so um, library media techs or academic coordinators don't know exactly who to contact to, for the ordering of the materials. So that's something that we're gonna be looking at and shoring up. Uh, we already had a team meeting on the things that we're gonna change for next year year and for the rest of this year. The communication, making sure that everybody involved has all the information of which textbook, um, which instructional materials or textbooks need to be ordered, making sure that they are on the approved list, and then making sure that they are ordered so that there's not duplicate orders or that it, someone's assuming that somebody else is doing it. A check-in process to the delivery to the warehouse. If you've ever visited our warehouse, it is a very large space and things can get lost in there. So making sure that we have on there like an estimated time of arrival from our publishers so that we know to be on the lookout and so that we can get them to the school sites as soon as possible so they also don't get lost within the warehouse. And finally, a delivery to the school where that there's a receipt or a picture. Um, think about what Amazon's doing now where they um, you'll get an email and you'll see a picture of where the item was left. So if um, we go into the school site and someone's not there, we don't want to like take the materials back because that delays the process. Instead, if we have in a secure place, take a picture, this is where it's left. So as soon as you arrive there the next morning, they are there. So those are just some of the things that we're looking at changing. Um, the other thing, this year we had close to $400,000 in loss of inventory over last year. Uh, this is from, a lot of it is due when students were working at home. This is roughly about two times the average amount of the loss of inventory for each year in the replacement of the textbooks. This is also something we're looking at within the school sites on the ins different incentives that we can have for our students, especially at the secondary level, in terms of bringing books back. Some schools do a, a lot better job than other schools, and so we're really going to be pushing to make it a consistent effort so that we are not spending so much money on the replacement of textbooks. The overall process, I really want to give a shout out to Minty White's teaching staff administration um, for being very well prepared. That was my favorite visit this year. But also to all of the um, teaching staff that we went into their classrooms that were gracious enough to go let us go in there. And then also the administration who was prepared for the Williams visit as we went and visited schools. I bet we were almost there because we had one hiccup with one school, but it was already fixed. And so when we were doing this in the Williams visit, um, there was one hiccup. It was fixed within the already ordered in the textbooks. So that's why I put it almost there. And I, this year, I'm very happy that all of us did go out there because there was a lot of ordering that we had to do with all the replacement of the textbooks. 
Um, it always comes up about laboratory science equipment. So one of the things that we did and we implemented it's within the, I believe it's in within the LCAP also, is that each school site will have an allocation to replace their science lab equipment. Last year during um, COVID, we um, each school site was also given a, a certain amount to buy to do labs that students could do in the home. So we had to find materials that were safe and chemicals that were safe on an ongoing basis. It's by per pupil. So if you notice that the the difference in dollar amounts, because that's based on a per pu pu per pupil amount, with our largest high school receiving the largest amount of money, and our high schools that don't have as many students are receiving um, less money because it is per pupil. The um, the proposed resolution is here that we held the meeting that we had sufficient textbooks and it means that each student including English learners has a textbook or instructional materials or both to use in class and to take home and starting in um, I believe it's 2014 that, that that includes online content so a big change for me this year was because so many of our textbooks um, are going online in our, in our adoption if students have access and now through um, when we were at home in distance learning every student has a Chromebook and so they have the um, availability to access the materials online that the very fact that most textbooks or materials are on the actual computer does suffice and it was very interesting because the county office had a larger mind sh shift and they were ready they're like oh yeah all the Chromebooks is online we're good to go and then I wasn't used to that because I was used to the old style of let's go out and let's count the textbooks but because it really is now a big shift and COVID did push us that way that's the way where we're thinking. The county office will be back um, in a few weeks to pre present the final report, which will state the um, sufficiency of the materials as well as the FIT reports, which at the last, I believe is the last regular board meeting when I was here, we looked at the FIT reports from last year. These will be the updated FIT reports for this year and that will also be presented at the upcoming meeting. And with that, questions and the closing of the public hearing. Are there any uh, public speakers to this item? Yes, there's one public speaker. Chris Webb. Oh, hang on. I'm going to speak for public comment. Yeah, okay. I'll change it for you. All right. And no public speakers. All right. Any questions or comments from the, uh, Trustee DeSerpa? So help, help me understand. So during COVID, while every, all the kids were home, they had textbooks at home that just didn't get returned. Yes. And so instead of trying to retrieve those from families, we decided to just purchase new textbooks? No, so we tried to retrieve them. Schools um, at different <laughs> levels tried to retrieve them, but we didn't get them back. The reason why that there was a larger loss is because when you're in school, you're generally taking your textbooks back and forth, and so you have more interaction with them. At home, with all of your materials, there's a more likely that the, the textbooks would have gotten lost, and that is what happened. So we tried to retrieve as much as we could. That is the loss of what we could not return that we had to replace so that all students have their textbooks okay because they're probably like under somebody's bed or yes 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 <laughs> they're there they're just not yeah yes. returned okay anyone else all right thank you thank you We'll move on to item 7.1, our public comment, and this is the opportunity for members of the public to address any issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. And just to remind folks that uh, the, though the Brown Act does, uh, does prohibit the board from engaging in discussion on non-agenda items, that we are listening to those comments. So do we have any uh, speakers for 7.1? Yes. Yes, we do, President Holm. So first speaker, Chris Webb. Uh, I want to express my deep appreciation to Trustee Orozco for hearing the community and acting appropriately to meet its needs at the SRO board meeting recently. Thank you for having the courage to stay on the correct side of history and knowing better than to make a rash decision in favor of a faux solution. After two consecutive administrators at my site have proved overly differential to uh, the ruling powers in this, the towers here and hostile to our um, model continuation school award winning student progress monitoring system, I had my doubts about the district's commitment to PBIS and restorative practices. After the SRO board meeting, uh, those doubts are enhanced. Uh, I think arresting kids instead of suspending is not, is not restorative. 
also as to, there were some comments about um, from the assistant soup on our program at Renaissance and it was said that it wasn't restorative and I think that is I, I don't feel like she's qualified to speak to our program in an accurate way um, it may not seem restorative when a student who misses class winds up missing um, a, an activity day or a recess type period or a student who's breaking school rules related to substances is barred from going to a field trip but when I talk to my students about this, they say that's real life. And our, the policies here reflect that. When if I get a moving violation on the way home, I can't do a field trip with my students. I cannot drive them. Um, I feel like what's the way a real opportunity is being missed to bring out restorative practices in a way that truly complements and does not supplant an effective program. And, and sh sh Shasu's right, students have been out for 18 months. That's why breaking an effective system is so dangerous at this time, because our students need the structure. Thank Fine. you. Thank you. Richard Martinez. How's everyone doing? So to start off, I respect everyone's opinion. But if we did listen to the community, half of you guys would be gone, right? They would ask for you guys to step down. So I'm not gonna say, listen to the community, do what's right. I witnessed something today at PV High where SRO's hands are tied. There was a guy about 28 years old on campus. They could not do nothing to this individual but try to usher him out. He was refusing. What no one for, everyone forgets is the SROs are also there to protect our CSCA employees, our campus security. They are there to protect them because they can only do some, so much. Also, they can only stand in the way between them and the children on site. This individual threw his bike, rolled it down the hill towards a girl walking up. That isn't right, and the campus security, hands tied. So I am glad you guys moved forward with that and brought them back, because they are needed. They might not like the conflicts between kids, teachers, but in the long run, CSEA is putting their life out there with these kids and also with police and people on campus that shouldn't be. So you guys need to consider that as well. 30 seconds. Thanks. Diana Martinez. Good evening, President Jennifer Holm. Uh, board of Trustees and everyone else in the room. Um, I am here to speak about, it's not CSEA. <laughs> I'm here uh, to speak about Diamond Technology. Um, you know, we have a PBUSD hidden gem and I hope you enjoy the informational packet for your reference. Um, but this is a more of a, did you know? Like, hmm. Did you know, Design Thinking in Schools Directory, Diamond Tech is the only public high school in Santa Cruz County with this distinction? Did you know two Diamond Technology students made it to the finals of the World Series of Innovation? Did you know 18 students were the first to complete the Santa Cruz County Credit Union's Comprehensive Financial Literacy Curriculum? Did you know Diamond Tech is the recipient of a gold medal with the Career Charter Series curriculum at my10yearplan.com? Did you know during the years at Diamond Tech, students create a portfolio which is presented at their senior defense? Um, my six months working at Diamond Tech, I took my husband around the campus and I was kind of a little bit kind of hurt because he walked in room eight and 
his eye, he was like a child in the toy store, and he's looking around. I was like, can I live here? Because he was amazed at the equipment, at all the um, equipment that they had there that the students have hands on. He was so amazed, and he wished when he was in school, he had that. So um, as I mentioned earlier, Diamond Tech is a hidden gem in PVUSD. And sincerely, I hope you take this information that piques your interest to find the time and heart to visit the school and learn firsthand the hard work these high school students endure at Diamond Tech. Thank you. Thank you. Esther Murillo. Good evening, everyone. My name is Esther Murillo, and I'm a proud retiree of Prohoe Valley Unified School District. And, during, and I, too, worked at Diamond Tech a lot longer than she did, and <laughs> and very, very proud of all the achievements that that school has endured and, and has risen. And um, the enrollment is, is growing. And I know that all the students there flourish, have amazing teachers and an amazing principal. But I'm here to talk to you about something else. Um, now that I'm retired, I have time to do many things. And one of the things that I am doing is approaching the community, the schools, to help raise funds. And on October 9th, we're going to be having a craft fair at Watsama High School. Um, and they're going to be local artists. We have over 30. And I have these sheets right here. So we have over 30 vendors of lots of arts and craft homemade goods, and I'm hoping that you find the time to come out and join us. I'd also like to give a personal thanks to Jennifer Shocker and Daniel Dodge, who have made effort to go on out and help and sponsor some of our up, uh, events, like GASA, um, raising funds for Watsma High School's, um, uh, what is it? The, um, Yes, the girls softball team. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jennifer. I love the fact that you went out there with your family, with their sneakers, and out there doing the walks with us. I really appreciate that. And that's teaching a valuable lesson to your children. So to getting involved and taking pride in your community. So I hope you guys take the time to come out on October 9th and join us. There'll be lots of food, um, activities for the students, and lots of art and crafts. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. Thank you, Esther. Anyone else? All right, we will move on to our employee organization comments. Um, so we'll, each organization will have five minutes. So do uh, PVFT. Good evening, President Holm and Dr. Rodriguez and Board of Trustees. Uh, I apologize, I was not necessarily prepared to be doing this. It's the last minute <laughs> that Nellie could not be here. So um, I'm gonna talk to you a couple of the agenda items that you will be looking at tonight. Um, and I want to just start by uh, talking about the continued number of vacancies we have in our classrooms in PVUSD and how that Im impacts our membership and our teachers. So um, two of our comprehensive high schools are particularly hard hit, Watsonville High and PV High, which means that a number of their staff are losing their prep on a regular basis. Um, and we know that that means that work has to get done after contract hours. That doesn't mean teachers don't prep for their students. So it's a lot of impact. Um, it's a lot of extra work on them. Um, we also know that you have a, an item on your agenda, 9.4 I believe it is, uh, where you will be voting on an MOU with CWA, which represents the substitutes in our district, to increase their long-term sub rate to $240 per day. I think that's great. We need substitutes. We need them in order to get our teachers out of subbing through their prep periods. Um, but I do just want to point out something to the board and to the public. A starting teacher in our district, their salary is $46,666. And if you break that down to per diem, it's $253.62. So it's not a whole lot more than what a uh, long-term sub-daily sub rate would be. 
Um, we've been working with PBUSD to help mitigate the impacts. We uh, recently did an MOU putting TOSAs back in classrooms. I know you guys know about that. Um, but it's just not enough. We need to attract teachers to teach here in this district, and we can't do that with that starting salary. Um, Another item that's coming up on your agenda, and um, there's a really great presentation slides in there, is uh, for our Migrant Seasonal Head Start program. Um, I believe it is slides 15, 16, 17, and 18 um, that illustrates the cost of living in this area. And um, it is much, much, much higher than the salary we are providing. People cannot afford to live here. Um, with that being said, the agenda item 10.6, our Migrant Seasonal Head Start program, that is a vital program in this area. Um, those teachers provide a, a, a vital service to the families here. Um, and they have the challenge of working the program running from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and the staffing running from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So this is something we um, are advocating for and working with the district on to staff this program, um, increase the staffing of this program that al would allow the teachers time to prepare for families and students to arrive. As the, as the program runs right now, they are both arriving and leaving, right, at this, at simultaneously. Um, it's also the only program we currently have that has members working split shifts. So we worked with the district recently to come up with an MOU uh, to, to mitigate sort of the impact of those split shifts on the members. Um, but personally, I think it, it needs to be compensated. Uh, gas prices are high. Not all of them live in this area and are driving home and then back to work. You know, that's four times in a day. So anyways, those are just a few of the things I'd like the board to be aware of and be thinking about for the district. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CSEA? I'll say all the same. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to piggyback off what she was just talking about. True, we have a big shortage of teachers. And it's also affecting CSEA. Going back to our campus security, they are monitoring, overseeing classrooms. They are in there with the students, watching classrooms when they should be watching the campus. Another reason why SROs should be on site. We cannot have this. It's a big safety issue. It's something we need to address. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, but did I not see PV High School say on the list that they're, they're gonna get a SRO? What's the reason behind that? Or am I mistaken? Are they getting one? Why? Do they matter? We need SROs at each location. And talking to the public, shoot, they, some of them would want them even in the middle schools. But look at what goes on, please. Look at the SROs in classrooms, takes away from the campus. It's a big, serious deal. We're short teachers, we're short staff, we're short CSA members for all. We need to fill these spots. We gotta do a better job recruiting. I tell friends, I tell people I know all the time, apply, apply, apply. But we need to do a better job with that. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have anybody from Pavam? President Home, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Veronica Aguilar, proud principal of Alianza Charter School, and I'm proud to be here representing PAVAM and the charter schools. Today I'm speaking on behalf of Linscott, WCSA, and Alianza. Linscott, 
super excited to have an after school program um, to offer to their students this year for the first time. They're also honored to participate with the charter school sports team with us, Alianza, in WCSA. So go Coyotes. We changed the name to put them all together. So we're super proud. And WCSA is off to a fabulous start of the school year. We are gearing up for our athletic sports program and the beginning of our Chameleon Student Leadership Council. Our two new shade structures allow us to spread out during lunchtime and gives our teachers the opportunity to teach outdoors, especially foundational reading, where students can read the teacher's lips. WCSA is extremely proud of their strong teachers and support staff, and honestly, are a solid and positive team. With our traffic getting better and faster each day, we are proud of our families for their flexibility and patience, as well as we navigate these challenging and busy times. We are chameleon strong. Alianza students, staff, and parents are off to a resilient start. We're excited to share we have been awarded a Spectrum Matching Grant, which will bring fourth grader, graders Latin dance. Also, our sensory path has finally been completed with the grant we received last year. You will find kinder through eighth graders hopscotching and doing the start posing through the use of the sensory path. Our new intervention teacher has begun working with our third and fourth grade students on SIPs. We're so happy to finally have it at Alianza to support and accelerate our transition from Spanish literacy to English. And just like WCSA, our shade structures are up and they're bringing just so much more open space for our students. And our after school program is off to an amazing start. We are on a roll as Armadillos. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone from CWA? All right. So we'll move on to item uh, 9.1, our 2021-2022 Extended Learning Program Plan. The report will be presented by Carol Ortiz, our Director of Extended Learning. Okay. All right. Make sure this works. Yeah. All right. All right. Good evening, President Holm, Superintendent Rodriguez, members of the board. I'm Carol Ortiz, Director of the Extended Learning Department here in PVUSD. I will be presenting to you our 2021-22 program plan and doing a brief review of the, the items that we presented last year. We came to you last year with our program plan, and I just wanted to share with you some of the, some of the outcomes of that. This is our department mission and vision statement. We first created it back in 2015, but it still holds true in that we um, really work hard to empower our students and our families academically, socially, um, to support them in college, career, and life. The next few slides are just summaries of programs that we implemented last school year, and thanks to you all for approving our last year's um, program plan. And because of your approval, we were able to impact hundreds of students last school year um, during COVID. We did have our safe space programs. We um, provided support to students during the day on distance learning, and then we supported them in after school, after distance learning ended. We also supported the transition back to regular day. Um, the in-person instruction in April worked collaboratively with transportation to provide support to students to go to their regular day program um, from the safe spaces. We also provided support to our district employees who needed childcare during COVID time. We supported hundreds of families and students, also high need students, not just district employees, to go to um, childcare with our collaborative community partners at the YMCA and the City of Watsonville Parks and Recreation. And that was a very successful um, program with our, with our families. And then this summer, 
we, we were able to implement the first full in-person program after the COVID school year, which was Camp Connect. Uh, I gave you a, a swag bag for, of our Camp Connect items. We love giving bags to our students or giving materials to our students. And I love seeing them out in the wild, kids walking on Rodriguez streets with their backpacks and things like that. It's very exciting. Um, we supported students in grades three to eight at our middle school programs. And um, it was very successful. The kids really enjoyed the social emotional learning aspect of the program and being able to be there in person with each other for the first time um, after a whole year of being in COVID. In total, we had about 100 extended learning staff members supporting us throughout last school year, and we served about 15,000 students in various capacities last school year. Also, I wanted to share with you some, well, I'll get to that, sorry. So this is just a summary of our 21-22 program plan. It's going to continue our, um, with what the CDE gave to us in terms of our um, kind of guidelines, which I did share with you last year. And of course, we're integrating restorative start with um, PBUSD's goals. I've also started conversations with Casey regarding doing some SIPs reading strategies training to some of our, um, three of our sites to start off with, because I feel it's really important that we start doing a little bit more tightening with the academic alignment with after school and regular day. So we're going to continue to focus on that this school year. These are our program focus areas, again, just as I presented to you last year. I did want to highlight some of the different things, a couple of different things down at the bottom under nutrition. We're going to focus our partnership with the um, Second Harvest Food Bank to focus on food security for our families. We're trying to fill in um, gaps and align services with our community um, and our community programs and what we can provide having the direct connections to students and families. We'll also be doing more green schoolyards at our middle schools and develop, um, strengthen our gardening programs there at the middle schools. We're going to tighten up our STEAM programs. We're going to make sure that they're more aligned in our after school programs this year. I shared with you um, the Kiwi kits, those boxes there, and please feel free to take them to your children or yourselves if you want to use them. They're a little bit difficult, so just be careful. Um, we talk a lot about Kiwi kits and to have the students, I wanted you to see exactly what it was. And it's just science building engineering. It's really exciting. The kids, this is really the highlight of the kids' work. Um, they really enjoy building these. So. Again, thanks to you and approving our program last year, we were able to offer Kiwi kits to all of our students and all of our programs also during the summer. Literacy development and book distribution is a personal passion of mine. Um, last year, we distributed books to students in grades pre-K to eighth grade. Um, we distributed over 100,000 books. It was during summer, during um, winter break, during spring break, and some of the examples of the reading books I brought here, we're gonna be doing social emotional learning packets of books. Um, we also gave during summer last school year learning packets with materials and workbooks, and we just hand these out to families, and so the students will have something to work on when they're at home. We also work very closely with City of Watsonville Public Library to collaborate on their reading um, reading challenges and offer reading challenges to our students as well to encourage them to go to the library. I just wanted just to publicly acknowledge all of our partner organizations. Extended Learning couldn't do all of this work without the support that the community provides to us and, and all the services that we're able to provide to our students thanks to our community partners. So in summary, um, the program funding this school year does allow for carryover for just the remainder of this school year. So December 31st, our monies do have, our carryover monies do have to be spent. We're working on that now. We will start getting it done once you approve our plan, if you do. Um, our activities that are listed in here will be funded all by grant. It's all grant funding. It's all either carryover or current year funding. There's no additional general fund that comes out to support any of these after school programs. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have one, Chris Webb.
Hi, um, I just want to say my students at Renaissance, they're, they're still eager to play sports, and um, I would hope that some funding could be provided to restore our field, and then also we used to have an in-person after-school program. And uh, with the absence of our positive learning environment from our old system, students have less reason to attend school now. Uh, one, one young girl who, Dr. Rodriguez, last year during small group in Peterson, uh, she spoke to this board. She doesn't, she doesn't come anymore, um, partly because of the changes that have happened. Uh, we need to have reasons for them to come, and after school is part of that. Uh, the credit reductions that have come from the, the state legislature, they only further downplay the importance of attendance and academics. Um, the restoration of in-person after school would be invaluable to our students. I've got students who uh, can't get into edgenuity anymore, and then other ones who wouldn't. Like, they, they don't have the home environment to pull that off. So we need to make sure we're serving even our um, most underprivileged students. Also, one last thing, I'm not sure if the funding would be for this, but we had a shade structure also implemented, but somehow it got planned and placed without any consultation of the staff or leadership team, and now it's outside the bounds of what was traditionally considered um, open to students, which creates extra demands for supervision from staff. Uh, we could use the actual shade structure that actually serve where our students normally hang out and are and would be in close proximity to the classrooms. That would better able teachers to move out into the quad if they need to. The, the shade structure we need would basically be around the quad. I just had to use um, some shade structure this week when, when my, I lost um, air conditioning and my room was really hot. So, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge, Jr.? Um, I, I just want to quickly say thank you, Carol Ortiz, for getting projects like this into the hands of our students. A lot of students and even parents don't have access to, you know, this could be expensive, mm -hmm. you know, and for families that have two or three children, mm -hmm. it's out of the, out of their reach. So mm -hmm. I just like to say thank you again for these kind of pro the do-it-yourself projects, the books that you've passed out, the, the seeds that you've passed out, the backpacks and the school supplies. Thank you very much for putting this together. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. My staff really keeps in mind um, what would students in a more affluent area be receiving what kind of opportunities and we try to provide that for our students too. So I appreciate you acknowledging that. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee Acosta? Hi, Carol. Hi. Um, I, I just want to um, somewhat echo what Trustee Dodge Jr. said and I want to thank you and commend you for all your work that you're doing. Um, with our students in the after school program. Um, also, I recall um, a time pre COVID, right? We have National Lights On Night coming up yes. in October. Will mm -hmm. we be participating mm -hmm. in that and advocating for that again this mm -hmm. year? Could mm -hmm. you remind us of the date in October if you know it off the top of your head? I will do that. I can do a, a B2B. Okay. I can totally do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Shocker. Thank you, President Holm. So thank you, Carol. I know you guys work very hard. Um, I was able to pass out books at Starlight and I didn't realize you guys gave 100,000 books mm -hmm. away this summer. That's amazing because I know all those kids were thrilled to be taking home books and kiwi crates and the look on excitement mm -hmm. was tremendous. Mm -hmm. And then at Camp Connect, um, kiwi kits were also a hit there and mm -hmm. um, I loved the paper mache project. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so th that was a, a fun one. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate you looking at things from outside the box to try and get kids involved. And I just wanted to mention, um, at Cesar Chavez, you actually opened up Camp Connect for some younger students, correct? Because some students couldn't attend because mm -hmm. they had to take care of their younger mm -hmm. siblings. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we will possibly consider doing in 2022 mm -hmm, if they have mm -hmm. the same problem yeah um, we did encounter that we had um, started with the for camp connect we invited the high priority students from the 
the district wellness referral list and we did find a lot of families unable to send the older students because they were taking care of the younger siblings so we did let them attend as well it's very successful um, this next summer uh, 2022 will probably look different because we'll probably be back in a full our full summer school mode but we definitely want to integrate the camp connect theme somehow that mindset that we did this summer into next summer's program for sure because it was very successful okay. thank you very mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. anyone else uh, trustee de Serpa? Thanks for um, what a great presentation. It's Thank you. very exciting. Um, so I've been on here a long time and I've had multiple presentations by different coordinators or directors. Um, and I have just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So in, under the area where you've listed out your partnerships and program funding, mm -hmm. like I added up all the proposed amounts and it's like $8.3 million, is that mm -hmm. correct? On the spreadsheet that was attached, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. That sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And all of that money is coming in. Is that a lot of the COVID, extra COVID monies, or do we normally get that much? We usually year? get that in our grants. Okay. This also includes carryover, though. And the grants come from the same exact funding source? Every year for our after-school grants, they are 21st Century Community Learning Center grants and ACES grants and assets which is the after the high school level grants those are separate from the new expanded learning opportunities funds that are just that just came out from the state okay in the past i just remember them coming in from multiple different sources and i don't know if it was because we were applying for other mm. opportunities or mm. if they've always just come from two or they've always been the three main funding sources okay. for our specific after school grants okay well that's mm -hmm. a crazy amount of money it is yeah yes. we're, our, our students are really fortunate mm -hmm. um we had a very robust program closed recently called Youth Now mm -hmm. in Watsonville that served a served a lot of um, vulnerable kids in mm -hmm. with tutoring and with opportunities and um, and had they been vendorized they likely could have survived mm -hmm. but they lost their biggest funder and had to close down their mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to become a vendor because it looks like what you're doing is taking this money and then pushing it to community organizations to provide this service. Mm -hmm. How how do these community providers know that this money is available for them to potentially hmm. become a vendor? Like, how do you vet them? How do you? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, actually, the the youth well specifically about the youth now. Anyway, I know there was a. Um, community meeting I would say probably three weeks ago um, just to discuss youth now in general and support and um, one of my staff members Jennifer Bruno participated in that meeting and there was a discussion on it, how can that gap be filled in other resources in the community so I know that discussion is going on and I appreciate Jen being able to be part of that conversation because we definitely want to be able to provide some support if there's any gaps that come out of not having that program so just to address specifically youth now but in general with regards to um community organizations i don't know specifically how the process works but i think it's just becoming a nonprofit organization and going through that state level paperwork on how you do that mm -hmm. and being able to provide that service out and there are a lot of there are a lot of vendors across the state that specifically provide support to after school. Um, I feel like here in Watsonville, we've really developed strong local community partnerships versus outside, you know, kind of statewide, more anonymous type of vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've become so comfortable with the vendors or the, the community partners that we have that we just kind of strengthen those partnerships over the years, um, which is why they're, if you look at the list, most of them are all local or organizations but um mm -hmm. yeah hope that answers your question not sure yes yeah, great okay okay thank you sure carol. trustee Orozco. thank you carol Hi. this is amazing thank um, you I uh, want to say that my kids also benefited from all those books and um, the kids, and they all love them so much. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that and the uh, great work that your team is doing. Thank you. Um, going back to the funding source, mm -hmm. so when we work with our uh, community partners, are we um, 
in a way subsidizing, for example, with YMCA? Are we in any way subsidizing the cost of uh, a child who maybe can't participate in the same Camp Connect? Uh, but maybe they can participate at the YMCA and have either the cost be subsidized mm -hmm. or fully cover through mm -hmm. these additional funds. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that we're currently doing? Mm -hmm. Or could could that be an opportunity that we can explore mm -hmm. moving forward? Mm -hmm. So last school year, during the COVID year, we did... Um, it, well, we usually partner with the YMCA every year to provide physical fitness courses, our swimming classes for after school programs and things like that. But last school year, we did expand that partnership to offer childcare specifically to district employees or high need students who just needed a full day kind of childcare program. Um, we did subsidize that um, thanks to the state flexibility in our funding and we families were not charged for any of that all year. Actually, it started last August, August 2020, right at the beginning of the school year and it went all the way through summer or August of 2021 actually and um, families didn't have to pay for any type of child care support through them. Um, we can definitely continue that as the need arises. Um, it did come up recently in a conversation regarding some foster youth students on you know kind of a different thing and supporting them to participate in the Watsonville um, Flyers after school program and needing to subsidize support with them maybe and we talked about doing that. So I feel like on a case by case basis there definitely is an opportunity to support our most high need families um, and because we have such great collaboration and partnerships with those organizations already it's definitely doable from our part. Yeah, I definitely think that we need to explore or expanding that option for families, especially mm -hmm. uh, over breaks and over the summer. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, they're not able to attend summer school or they just need that full day um, experience where they're not only uh, working on their social skills, right, but they're being exposed to this amazing activities, right? Mm -hmm. They have themes mm -hmm. every every week and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there'll be, uh, I think, a benefit uh, mm -hmm. to to um, those families that cannot afford something like that over yep, the summer. I totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. I know that the YMCA does offer some subsidy for families, but mm -hmm. it doesn't cover the full cost. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking at that possibility of like, you know, we can cover the other half, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. potentially. So mm -hmm. that's something, an area that I, I definitely think we need to explore. Mm -hmm. um, in, in addition, there's, um, I think, a gap that we haven't considered in the past, and that's um, spring break. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I know the YMCA also offers, um, you know, uh, some sort of activity that's full day two uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for those gaps when students mm -hmm. are out of school and so mm -hmm. forth. So I think it's, you know, just keeping kids involved as much as possible, exposure to role models, exposure to mentorship and exposure to sports and, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that awesome experience, mm -hmm. I think is beneficial. I think so too. Um, many, many years ago when I was a teacher, I taught during um, winter intercession, um, fifth grade. And I know that kind of programs, they depend, you know, it, they come and go depending, but just thinking about this year and, and having students come back after that, a really difficult year, filling in those little, like you're saying, those little breaks or pieces that we don't really think about, this might be the year to, for us to kind of yeah. think about providing something special this just this school year to get kids, keep them on track when now that they're back. Keep them on track, mm -hmm. close those gaps, and offer as much support as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, aside from that, thank you for working on food security. Mm -hmm. I think that's another thing that not maybe not yeah. families are experiencing yeah. yet, but mm -hmm. many are. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for, for working on that. I think wherever we can help, mm -hmm. we should. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone I missed? Just, just a question. Oh, oh, I'm oh. sorry. I didn't want to cut you off. Do oh, you have okay. any comments? Just, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you know, <laughs> as somebody who also, whose kids have also benefited from mm -hmm. this, and, and just watch Good. them light up on, on the activities that they get to do. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I get to directly see it, but I also get to hear about it. You mm -hmm. know, from you know my neighbors, from you know, like when, when I'm standing in the line at the grocery store and people are like talking in front of me, and I'm like, yes, that's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, yes. <laughs> so it's it's. Your, the work is appreciated, and please extend that to the team. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Um, so with that, I'll make a motion. 
um, <laughs> Thanks. to approve action item 9.1 um, for the 2021-2022 extended learning program plan as Thank presented. You. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. I'll second, second it. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. First and second, I'll call the vote. Sorry. Uh, first and second, so I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your time. All right, moving on to 9.2, approve resolution 21-22-10, our 2021 refunding certificates of participation. The report will be presented by Clint Rucker, our uh, chief business officer, and Dale Scott, our, uh, the president of Dale Scott & Company. Good afternoon, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So actually a little bit excited. Normally I get to come up and tell you either not so good news or things the state's doing. This time I get to tell you about how we're actually gonna be saving money and it's actually really a great thing. So back in 2019, um, you all may remember, we did a certificate of participation, which was really a way of financing buying this building. So originally we were renting this building. When we did our certificate of participation, we did an equal amount of what we were paying annually in rent, which actually allowed us to get some additional money and what we ended up paying in debt is what we were paying in rent to begin with. So I'm not going to bore you with all of the details because that's why I have Dale Scott here to bore you with all the details. But no, he's actually going to give you a great little presentation, um, very brief, just to show you that what will uh, refinancing do for us. And um, really, as Dale kind of put it to me, is it's almost a no-brainer because you see the savings that we're going to realize, and it's great. So I'm going to, with that, kick it off to Dale as he is much more of an expert than I am. Good evening. Um, well, Clint took most of my presentation, so uh, I will move quickly through this. Um, you, as Clinton mentioned, um, you financed this building at the beginning of 2019. The slide in front of you shows uh, a example of municipal interest rates, rates for the type of security you uh, sold uh, over the last 10 years. And you can see where we are all the way over on the right-hand side. I don't know if we have a light on this, but maybe not. Um, 2019, when you sold it, is about one-fifth of the way in. So rates have fallen greatly. Um, because of that, you have the ability to refinance these into lower interest rates. Nothing very magical about that. Uh, certainly similar to any refinancing of a home loan, for example. These are your current payments um, graphically. So you're paying about $1.3 million per year to pay off this loan. It goes up about 3 or 4% per year. What we're going to do, and to put it in the simplest form, is the people that loaned you this money um, are now getting paid interest rates higher than the current market. And that's really what's happening. They bought them at a time when rates were higher, now they're getting paid. To make it really simple, we are going to take those away from them, and we're going to do that by issuing new certificates in order to fund that uh, sort of replacement. So what will happen is, assuming the board passes this resolution tonight, um, we will then go through the process of doing a new financing called a, a refunding or a refinancing. That'll happen in September. We will then work with an underwriter to price the new certificates, and then we'll take those funds, once they're received by the county, we'll take those funds and we'll use them to pay off the old, and then you will start paying off the new. And when that all happens, you can see with the little gray that's above those uh, blue bars, your costs are going to drop by roughly $100,000 a year. That's going to come up, actually more than $100,000 a year. That is going to come up to a total savings, right now we estimate, estimate of about $3.2 million overall. So as Clint said, this has um, very little downside. If for some reason, um, even though you pass the resolution tonight and we get to that point of actually trying to finance it, something has happened with the interest rates and the savings has gone away, then we simply stop the process. There's no charges, uh, no costs due to the uh, from the district. And then we wait until interest rates hopefully return to that rate uh, level. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have, and I urge your acceptance of the resolution. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. President Holm. Any questions or comments from the board? 
Uh, Trustee DeSerpa. Hi, thank you for the presentation. This seems like a no-brainer to me. It's exciting to save money to the taxpayers, really. Um, I know that we have a certain rating based on the fiscal solvency of the district. I'd like to know what our current bond rating is today. Mm, I believe the current bond rating is A1, but I'd have to back check that. That's not, great, because yeah. it didn't used to be that high, so that, that's great news, yeah. Um, and then, so we, it looks like our estimated, you said 100,000, but I see no. on this slide it says an estimated average annual savings of 248 yes, or 40. Yeah, my eyesight is not great. <laughs> I was just trying to read it off the bars, but you are right. That's about it's about a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's great. And our term is it 20 years? No, it ends in 2034. Mm -hmm. So 12 years. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you will own this building and will not be paying any rent. That's great. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll make a motion to approve this. Any further comment? I'll second the motion. All right. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. All right. We shall move on to item 9.3. Um, approve the variable term waiver request, our WB1 form, for our speech language pathologist, uh, Allison Niazawa. Yes, good evening, President Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. So before you tonight is a request for a variable term waiver, waiver uh, for Trisha Murren. She is a current SLP in our district. Um, she was hired in 2004 as a teacher, and in the 1920 school year, she uh, moved over to be an SLP, and so she is continuing her program. Um, just for a little recap on the variable term waiver, it is it is offered for a few different reasons. It's one is the applicant is unable to either complete their clinical practice hours, coursework, examinations or performance assessments due to COVID. So we're still continuing um, with the variable term waiver and she is also continuing with it. So I would um, request that you approve her variable term waiver so we can continue her in her position. Thank Please. you. Mm -hmm. Any public speakers to this item? Any speakers? Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Is she through with the program yet or still in the middle of it? She's still finishing it, okay. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Roscoe, did you? Okay. Uh, trust, uh, Vice President Shaka? Um, so with this waiver, are we still short any SLPs or are we there? Um, I don't believe we have any current vacancies. We are continuing to recruit because we do have some filled with agencies, and so we're always continuing to recruit for our PVFT bargaining unit members. Um, but to my knowledge, we don't have any unfilled, I'll just say it that way, that are unfilled with at least an agency or a, or a PVUSD employee. Okay. And how long has um, Trisha been working with us? I'm sorry? How long has she been working with us? She's been working with us since 2004, but in this capacity since 1920, okay. the 1920 school year. So this is her third year as an SLP with us. So it looks good that she'll hopefully stay with us. Yes. Thank you. She's been with us since 2004, so <laughs> I think she likes us. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve this item. All right. I've got a uh, first. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. So uh, going on to item 9.4, approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and CWA, mm -hmm. increased long-term substitute pay. Yes, me again. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, so my department's been asked a lot, uh, what are you doing to recruit, and what have you been doing, and what efforts have you been putting forth? So. Um, one thing that I was finding and talking to uh, my technician that does our substitutes is like, well, how can we not get people to stay in these long-term subpositions? Why can't we get them to go in there? What's happening? Help me understand. Um, we haven't had this problem before. Um, and one of them is, is the difference between the day-to-day -day sub rate pay, which is $180 um, for, for the majority of our subs that are in our district versus the 200, and, the 200 a day um, rate. 
And for them to have to lesson plan, set up the classroom and basically fill in that role versus a day-to-day -day sub is usually going into the classroom with sub lessons, sub plans already prepared. Um, I was hearing the feedback that it wasn't worth the work because it was such so close to the other rate. Um, so we negotiated with CWA and looked to increase that as a way to mitigate that or acknowledge the work that's significantly different from those that are just in the day to day that come in with a lesson plan in a classroom already established and those that are walking into a classroom that A on the first day maybe hasn't been established or they establish that classroom. They're a lot, oftentimes our long-term subs do go to back to school night um, and if we have them still in the spring open house. So they are doing the work um, that's a little bit more closer aligned to, to our teachers. Um, and so I am, also noting that although it's close to what the starting pay is for our teachers, the substitutes do not receive benefits. So it is an unbenefited position, whereas our, our teachers that we hire and substitute get our benefits. Um, so I'm requesting that you approve this MOU tonight to help us try to mitigate and get attract people to take our long-term sub positions. Well, thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speakers. Right. And thank you, you answered my question about the benefits, so I was oh. going to ask you about that. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments from the board? Just here, Oscar? A quick one. Um, Allison, uh, just looking back at years, um, do we ever get uh, any of our long-term substitutes sign on? We do. We do. Our sub, our sub opportunity is a lot of times we get people either that have retired and come back, um, or we get people that are new to teaching and they want to try it out before they want to decide if they want that to be their career path. So, we, as they screen in and come in, it's also an opportunity for us to look at their credit, look at their, um, their transcripts to see if they also would qualify for a STIP, a PIP, any of the emergency waivers that we could actually put them in a classroom under a under a um, probationary contract. Um, so it's a good opportunity for us to get get staff in the door in a different venue than just coming in as a fully credentialed teacher. Great, so. and is, is that ever publicized as part of um, the job description that goes out? Meaning like the other opportunities the for other opportunities? Um, that's a good question. I can double check if we're putting that kind of on the post as, you know, if you have these, we can help you get X, Y, and Z to get into classroom positions. I think that would be great. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll look into that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So with that, I make a motion to approve this item. Great. Do we have a second? a second? All right. We have a first and a second. Um, any other comments before I call the vote? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. You know, I, I do have a, a final comment if you would allow me to say oh, one thing. Okay. I mean, I do think it's a good point what the union said it, it, in that this particular long term sub daily rate is nearly identical to what our first year starting s salaries are. So I think we, as if we, if and when we open negotiations with the union, I'd like to take a look at all that. Thank you. All right, so we're moving on to item 9.5. Um, approve resolution 20-22-12, recognizing October, uh, 10th through 16th. So I was like reading reading the okay. date going uh, 2021 as week of the school administrator. And yes, me again. Um, so thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I get the distinct pleasure of presenting the resolution for school administrator week, which is uh, beginning October 10th. Um, school administrators often are probably referenced as the site principals, the site administrators, but all of my colleagues behind me and at the tables are also considered uh, school administrators or so classified administrators administrators, our directors, our coordinators, um, our superintendent, assistant soup. So that, that encompasses um, our school administrators. I think now more than ever, we're seeing our, our administrators wearing many, many, many hats, um, doing many, many various jobs to help keep our schools um, up and running and functioning and, and having them be a um, welcoming environment for our students who need it so desperately. And so I, I'm not going to read all the whereas is and go through each and every one, even though they're all very important, but I do want to say that research does show that great schools have great principals and great districts have great superintendents, and I think we have both of those, and I'm proud to be a part of this district. So please, I uh, uh, request that you approve the resolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any public speakers? No public speakers. 
Any questions or comments from the board? Um, go ahead, get, uh, Vice President Shocker. I was just going to make a motion. So. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I've you know over the last year in particular, I've had a, an opportunity to you know really talk to a lot of our administrators and you know our site principals, in addition to the conversations I've, ha I've had with other district personnel, and you know just getting a, a fuller picture of the work that our entire team does and how that fits together, and you know so I'll definitely be supporting this resolution and I just, you know, in the spirit of that, just to thank you for the work that you all are doing. Thank you, President Holm. Um, I would like to make a motion, but before that, I'd just like to say a thank you to all our administrators out there, especially um, those who are pitching in extra hours and extra time right now with everything that we have going on. So I make a motion to approve. Okay. I'll second the motion, also noting the different hats uh, that they have taken on, especially with the start of the new year um, and everything that we have going on from even working as janitors and moving desks and so forth. So it's um, just thank you for all your hard work. And I'll second that motion. Great. I have a, first I have a comment. Okay, go ahead. Um, administrators are typically the first at schools and the last to leave. Um, have you know, upwards of 20 something to 35 direct reports are in charge of the school, have to deal and um, multi problem solve millions of things every day. So, uh, v in deep appreciation for all the work that's done um, on the campuses across the district and to the cabinet, thank you, and to our superintendent, thank you for all the hard work. We really appreciate you. All right. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I meant to say aye. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries. All right. So we. That's right. So 9.7. Uh, so we're skipping 9.6 for now. So 9.7 MOU between PVSD and UCSF, our California Learning Kit Study, and Casey Clappenbach. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Staff is excited to be able to bring forth this MOU for your approval tonight. Um, because of PVUSD's outstanding reputation, um, based on all of our work with reading science and the SIPS implementation, we were actually invited to be part of this partnership. So through this U, um, MOU, PVUSD will be partnering with UCSF um, for a dyslexia screening pilot project as part of their ongoing study to validate um, their instrument. And so this new instrument and project is designed to connect tools and resources to every teacher so they can support and help every student. So the study will include TK through first grade students from Ansoldo, Calabasas, Ohlone, and Rio Del Mar. So we it was able to span across our district representing each of the each of the areas and regions. Um, and cur um, currently our early elementary dyslexia screeners um, out there measure foundational skills, right? And they are very predictive of students that have those that are at risk at, st at struggling with those foundational skills pieces. Um, with that said, they're effective there, but they often over-identify some of our students and then miss others, especially when it comes to our English learners. And so that's why it's really important that we are part of this um, this study and group. Um, this new one that will that's being developed and added, it not not only hits those foundational skill pieces based on um, the, the science, the reading science, but it also hits five new areas, which is family history, so it actually has a survey with the parents, speech production, social emotional, executive functioning, and mathematical recognition, and um, visual um, spatial um, areas. So it's hitting other areas too. It is also going to be um, language agnostic, meaning that it will also also, it will be more effectively and efficiently um, supporting our English learners and students that are in dual immersion programs also. 
So through this, um, this MOU, we will also be able to, our teachers are actually not administering it. Their trained proctors are doing it. So it's not taking up our, our teacher's time. It's just that partnership and that space. And so they will also be able to support us in the future at looking at and utilizing that data to support learning once it gets um, validated and will also help us to look at the strengths and challenges of our students and what where they're at with their learning too so we can be proactive in planning lessons for them after the data. So um, staff does request approval of the MOU for the 21-22 school year with UCSF. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. All right. Any discussion from the board? Yeah, uh, Vice President Shocker. Thank you, Casey. Can you just tell us why only, why the four schools that you chose, or why are there only four sites? Because I know I'm going to get that question. <laughs> yes, great question. So because it is a pilot, so they're doing a validation study. So they're taking small groups of populations of students and partnering with different districts. So right now, I believe there's only 10 other areas. That's not even 10 other districts, just 10 other places where there's at least one school. Like we have Morgan Hill, Hollister, and then it's, it's also going all the way up to San Francisco and a couple um, in Southern California also and so it's just validating that that study and so why those schools because first of all we need a, a, a couple classrooms in space right so that's one reason and then the other reason as you're looking at it um, we um, if you're looking at the schools that are chosen also is it's making sure that we're representing of uh, representative of all the areas in our district because it, it, it does space and from all the way our Pajaro schools, right, all the way to our Aptos schools and Watsonville here. And can you just also explain, I know you did a little bit in the MIA, but most people traditionally think dyslexia is just seeing reversed letters on a page, which we now know that is not true. There's mm -hmm. a lot more um, symptoms and signs of dyslexia. Can you just explain that a little bit further? Well, yes, it's actually a lot of their auditory processing and how students are actually hearing and seeing things and being able to process those sounds and then be able to, then they're being asked to do something on print. Right, so that's where a lot of the the literacy pieces come into play. But this one is going to be more of a full throttle, whole child, right, piece where it's actually hitting that that numeracy piece, the spatial, the memory, the the working memory too. Thank you for clarifying that. So, I'll make a motion to approve pending other board member questions. Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I, I just wanted to say briefly, you know, thanks for putting this together. You know, I, I mentioned I mean, when me and my brothers attended these schools, um, they didn't know what dyslexia was. You know, they just assumed that he just couldn't read. But it was because of, of programs that found out that my brother was dyslexic. I, I think this is great to save families a lot of grief, you know, that it, they, they told my brother, oh, well, you know, he has a, I, I can't remember exactly what they're saying, but when you catch it early, there's ways you can help, I guess, fix it, as they say, and catch it early so they don't have to go to the struggles of, it, it was harder. It was hard on my parents, you know, because they didn't understand dyslexia, and, you know, and so this, this is a good way to catch it early and try to work on it. So, thank you. Trustee Orozco? Okay, so I'm assuming that this will be a pilot to scale, possibly. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so right now they're in their validation year, so they're actually validating and making sure that it, it works. it's worked, it's valid, um, and it is based on all the most recent neuroscience. So the state of California actually asked them to be working on it because they want to be able to actually open it up to all of the state of California for free. Great. So we will be recognized as part of that research group that helped um, to help, you know, be part of the study to validate. That's great. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll second the motion. All right. And uh, Trustee DeSerpe, did you have a comment? Yeah, this is exciting mm -hmm. that it's recognized. I love that there's early intervention pieces that potentially would go with this. 
thing that I always am concerned about are um, organizations that want to come in and use our kids as guinea pigs and then do a bunch of piloting and studying and then nothing comes of it. So I'm hopeful that um, that this study will actually yield some benefit to kids all across California, including ours. Thanks. And I just, did you? I, I just wanted to add, you know, it's, um, you know, in healthcare, whenever you're, you know, conducting tests, you've got your tests that are, you know, have specificity and then sensitivity. And it sounds like we've had very sensitive screening that flags, you know, a lot. But, you know, if you're actually treating something, if you're actually dealing with it, you've got to deal with the actual issue. And so having a very specific mm -hmm. screening test, like what it sounds like they're looking at, you know, it's like I, I teach adults. Right, but so many of the adult learners that I have, you know, have struggled with a lack of an appropriate diagnosis for their learning difference. And what a difference it makes when the right interventions happen and, you know, just the, the abundance of information in the literature that shows the earlier we can do that, you know, the better the outcome. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited that we get to participate in this. And you actually hit the, the nail on the head too, because we want to make sure that we're providing the correct intervention. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it actually does add another obstacle to that student, yep. right? And then we're wasting our time, we're wasting our resources, and then we're setting the child back. Yeah, so fantastic. All right, well we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, back to 9.6. Um, approved notice of completion for Ann Soldo um, ES, the restroom modernization project. Uh, not Ryan, but Clint. <laughs> Good evening again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, I am filling in for Ryan tonight. Um, Gary was going to fill in for him, but he unfortunately took ill, so I'm filling in actually for Gary, who was filling in for Ryan. But um, So the first item I have for you is actually the approval of um, the notice of completion for our Ansoldo restroom project. So that was completed. We had EM, one of our planners, working diligently on that project, and he was able actually to get it done in um, what I feel like is five short months, but it was probably five very long months for him. So at this point, we are just asking the board to approve the notice of completion so we can send it to, send it to the Santa Cruz County Recorder. Great. Any public speakers? No speakers. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? I make a motion to approve the completion order. All right. I've got a motion. Do I have a second? A second. No. All, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, so uh, 9.8, change order number one for Aptos Junior High NPR improvement projects. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So for you, I have the first change order we have actually on our um, Aptos Junior um, multipurpose room project. What happened is we had two different items that we actually worked with. One was with the construction of several different additions to the NPR. We needed to actually do some unexpected movement of electrical and actually add additional electrical, so that was one of them. The other was there was an unknown electrical uh, box apparently in the flooring that was not in our original plan, so not due to the fault of the contractor, but really that we had incomplete plans. Um, they actually had cut that while doing some of the demoing, so we need to actually replace that piece as well. So those are the two. This actually will bring, um, our current project is still well under our 10% contingency. This is actually only uses up 1.77% of our contingency. Great. Thank you. So I would request that the board approve this change order. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speakers. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Trustee Soto? Yeah, thanks. Um, how much of a delay is this going to put on the project? Um, so my understanding from Connor um, right now is that the delay won't be significant, that the contractors believe that they can do the work um, within the process of doing the other electrical and pieces that they need to do. So I haven't heard that there'll be any major delays. Um, according to the change order, there'll be no days of work added to the project. Okay. And is that going to uh, consist of saw cutting and everything that got opened up the floor to get to it? Um, you know, I can look into that, but Oscar, you would probably know better than I. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious because that's going to add time to the project. Yeah, I can definitely look into it for you and check with Connor to see exactly what they need to do and get you an answer. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. 
Make a motion to approve this change order. All right, I've got a first. Do I have a second? I'll second. second. Okay. Great. All right, I've got a first <laughs> and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. All right, approve change order number one for EA Hall Middle School Sports Field Project. Please continue. Thank you, President Holm, once again, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. So on this one, um, you may all have heard of COVID-19, and it's caused a few problems in our society, and apparently a lot of problems with construction and with building. Um, supplies are very difficult to get a hold of, so we've actually found that these precast basins for drainage that would go into the field are months of lead time. So rather than taking those months of lead time and making the poor students at EA Hall wait even longer, for their field, we've actually found an alternative, which are actually um, nyroplast basins, which are, from my understanding, is actually a better solution, according to um, our planning department and construction. They are a little bit more pricey, but they are immediately available. So this won't add any time delays to the project, which also means we don't have to deal with any of the contractors' um, delays as well, where they could potentially charge us for delays of the project as they are waiting for supplies. So on this, I would recommend the board approve the change order. Again, this one is for $16,000 roughly, and it adds about 1.08% to the uh, total project, so still well below the 10%. Thank you. Any public speakers? No speakers. Questions or comments? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr.? Uh, I have a question. Um, what date are we looking at to be done by? Will, be, will we be done by winter time? Yeah, so the, the expected original date was prior to December, and as long as we are continually moving forward, that still should be met, and that's one of the reasons we want to do this change order, because we don't feel that delaying this project is, especially with if we, you know, if we get lucky and get rain in a way where California needs it, um, but at the same time, we don't want to get unlucky and get rain during the project. So putting this in will hopefully keep that project on task. And yes, the original date was set to be done before December, and that's still what we're targeting. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll make a motion to support this agenda item. Uh, Trustee Acosta? Um, I would just... Um, want to chime I, i'm going to second the motion and um just wanted to add the comment that you know we've been waiting a long time to see this get done at ea hall and so um thank you for making it and keeping it on track yeah. hopefully it's done by that before that december deadline thank you so that's my second uh trustee deserpa did is there a track on this field around it is so it again, um, the, the infamous track um there is not going to be <laughs> <laughs> a synthetic track placed around the field. Now, originally, you may remember that this project was delayed. One of the reasons for the delay was they actually shifted kind of the orientation of the field just slightly. And what that allowed is that a track could be placed at a later date. Right now, though, it'll only have a dirt track surrounding it, but there is a potential to be able to add a track. So I've asked about 100 times if we could contact the Wharf to Wharf to find out if they would help us install a synthetic track. And I'm asking please to, to contact Wharf to Wharf. They wanted to help us with this project in the past, and I think it would be great if we could talk with them. Yes. So we did have that conversation with them. They were willing to up to 100,000 support. Unfortunately, the synthetic track is over a million. So I, we, do, we do appreciate their support, but 100,000 is, is not going to get us the, yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's synthetic. So there is a, I know that most people know, we, there will be a track, it just won't be a synthetic track. So they will, there will be a dirt um, circular. Yes. Um, and so people will still be able to walk the track. It's just, it won't be the synthetic at this time. Um, but the good part is, is we changed it so we can upgrade in the future if we wind up having the money. Mm -hmm. So. So we did. We did reach out to them. All right. Well, we have a. Did you? Did you have a? Okay. So um, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion Thank carries. you so much. All right. All right. So um, on to consent agenda. I'd like to make a motion to approve um, consent agenda, but I'd like to pull item 10.6. All right, so we I'll have, a, we have a first and a second with pulling 10.6. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, 
It's a first, sorry, I forgot to ask, are there any public speakers? Oh, sorry, my bad. Yeah. No public speakers. Okay. <laughs> As. Sorry, I called for the vote. Yes. So we had ayes. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. And then so 10.6? Yep. So I just wanted to um, address the issue, and I believe we addressed this before, um, Dr. Rodriguez, but maybe just to reiterate it, or Allison, um, there was a reason that we couldn't do gas for the split shifts. Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, we looked into being able to pay for transportation. We do it when we when, when employees are going between sites within a day. So we, we have that already if they're going to two different sites. So if their split shift is at one of their sites for one part of the day and another site for the other part of the day, that's where we're providing mileage. Um, but we can't provide mileage for employees to go to and from work. And then um, have we ever looked at um, a stipend um, type situation or payment plan for Migrant Head Start where if they are working split shifts um, or if they are agreeing to work 12 hour shifts or 13 hour shifts um, because I know they'd like to add in an extra hour for prep and cleanup. So right, so those would be negotiated that? items and those are open to the sunshine mm -hmm. process. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? All right. Would you like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. <laughs> All right. Second. I have, a, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, so item 13.1, our action report on closed session. Are there any items to report? Yes, I have two items to report. So I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on September 22nd, 2021 with 12 and three additional action items. No second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on September 22nd, 2021 with 13 and 15 additional action items. Got a first, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. Anything else? And that's it. Um, we need to report on expulsions. That wasn't on my cheat sheet, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to, um? So item 2.4, correct? Yeah. 2.1. 2.1. So for item 2.1, The board voted um, unanimously mm -hmm. to approve the expulsion referral um, for both expulsions. So item 2.1 had two expulsion referrals. Both were voted unanimously to approve expulsion. No? Do you want me to do them? Sure. Go okay. ahead, Maria. Um, the my... board. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. Um, so the board uh, approved uh, the recommended district administration for um, number 2122002 for a full expulsion for the remainder of the 2021 school year with placement at another school outside of the district on a strict behavior contract. Under that item, the um, board also approved the uh, district recommendation for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 21-22 school year with placement on another school in the district on a strict behavior contract for student 21-22-003. Thank you, Trustee Orozco. Thank you. All right, anything else on our closed session items? All right, so our next meeting will be a regular board meeting on October 13th, 2021. And with that, we are adjourned at 8.45.